uh, how you change um, the effect of changing certain parameters on engines and things. So hopefully you'll find it a bit interesting. Uh, more than, uh, well, I don't want to say it's more interesting than useful, but uh, it's, hopefully you'll find it a bit interesting. Okay, so we'll yeah. just uh, crack on with it then, because it, it shouldn't yeah, take an hour to go through this. So it's a, it's a short shift again. I quite like these short shifts, though. they're pretty good. You, you've seen this before, eh? Mm -hmm. Right, so this is a, a short introduction to uh, gas turbines. Um, I used to work for a gas turbine company, so um, I think I'm quite knowledgeable in, the, in this area. You, you're allowed to dispute that if you want. Right, okay, so a little recap then. You generally uh, analyse a gas turbine with a steady flow energy equation. And it's all this, it's just like really one equation, and it's all the same stuff. It doesn't matter what component you're analysing, it's the same all the time. So there's, there's nothing, I don't think, too difficult about this. So here we're saying, um, in this case, with the steady flow energy equation, that heat in and work out a positive. So we tend to use that equation all the time, and also the general gas equation, which uh, I'm sure you've seen all this uh, stuff before in previous uh, years of st study. Ah, we've just had an addition here, so uh, we'll have a little... Uh, a little minutes uh, these, uh, uh, these, uh, recess. recess. Yes. So uh, we're American, are we? Well, I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you apologise? Uh, it's, it's not good enough. There's no, there's no cakes. Where's the cakes? I was just talking about gas turbines. You have seen this before, because it was the one that. I, Gave it last year, remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, I think it's a bit more interesting than uh, just going through the notes. So, okay, so uh, just had a, we had, a, we had a quick look at the, because we just, we just started. So we had a quick look at the steady flow energy equation and the general gas equation. So uh, a gas turbine is generally a constant pressure cycle, heat supplied and heat rejected. Uh, these processes occur and they're reversible at constant pressure. Expansion and compression pro uh, processes are reversible. This is in the constant pressure cycle, this is not in the real cycle. Okay, so this is an idealized cycle. And the cycle is shown on a, a terms of entropy and pressure volume diagram. So here we are. So if we look at the more familiar uh, diagram on the right, you can see it between one and two you've got isentropic compression. Between two and three, you've got heat addition at constant pressure. And between three and four, you've got uh, isentropic expansion across a turbine, and then you've got cooling between four and one. Okay, that's a simplified uh, plant for you. So this is a closed cycle gas turbine. Uh, this is called uh, uh, the dual or Brayton cycle. Now I'm just showing you this for, more or less for information. Nobody really uses this, um, where um, the fluid continually cycles around the plant. Most gas turbine power units are uh, open cycle. So generally it applies uh, the same to this as what it does with the open cycle. Work input to the compressor is uh, Cp T2 minus T1. Uh, work output from the turbine is Cp T4 minus T3. And heat supplied to the heater is Cp T3 minus T2, and rejected in the cooler is Cp T1 minus T4. Okay, now um, I don't know how familiar you are with this stuff. It's called stagnation in properties. Um, it's fairly significant when you're dealing with gases inside our gas, our gas turbine. Okay, it's kind of like uh, if you talk about 
uh, stagnation enthalpy is the enthalpy plus the enthalpy equivalent of the velocity. Okay, so what the stagnation means, uh, what the enthalpy would be if the gas was brought to rest adiabatically without water transfer. So what we've got here is, generally in an open cycle gas turbine cycle, all you deal with is stagnation temperatures and pressures. For what you're going to do, it's unlikely that you would deal with static temperatures and pressures. Okay, so this is for uh, stagnation uh, enthalpy, and this is for stagnation uh, temperature. So all we're doing to get from here to here is we're dividing through H is equal to CPT. So we just divide through by CP. So, and this C squared upon 2CP is a dynamic temperature. Okay, and T here is referred to as static temperature. So no big deal with that. Uh, if you're speaking about stagnation and temperatures and pressures and things, you don't really talk about the velocity term or the kinetic energy term. It's just kind of implied. But stagnation and static pressures and temperatures are related uh, in this manner, which is kind of the same as the perfect gas equation. Okay. Uh, All right. Okay. So, to find the stagnation pressure, it can be it can be found from here. That's when it's compressible. Uh, when it's incompressible, uh, stagnation uh, pressure is found from the static pressure plus a half rho c squared. Okay. So this is for uh, incompressible flow, and this is for uh, uh, compressible. It's a bit more complica complicated. Um, you can get this stuff from textbooks on compressible flow. Okay, so here we are. This is a bit different now. Um, we look at a TS diagram. You can see that uh, generally coming into the engine, the, the gas will have a bit of velocity. So the stagnation temperature on the way in is always higher than the static temperature. And when it leaves, well, okay, the temperature here. The exit temperature, the stagnation exit temperature will always be greater than the st exit st static temperature. Okay, so it's kind of obvious because you can't get a c squared term to be negative. Okay, so stagnation properties are always greater than static. Uh, isentropic efficiency, I'm sure you've come across this before. It's generally just the length of lines. And static uh, isentropic efficiency is always less than one. So it's always less than one. And so here it is, is you've got the, for a compressor, you've got the uh, ideal temperature rise divided by the stagnation temperature rise. We, we said before that um, uh, static, uh, stagnation temperature is always greater than static. And in a turbine, it's kind of a little bit um, sort of different. When you expand, you'll expand to a temperature that is uh, higher. The stagnation temperature is higher than the static temperature that you're going to uh, expand to. Okay. Right, so um, here we are again for this polytropic. So there's polytropic efficiencies, a bit like isentropic efficiency, they can, they can be related. You'll see that on the uh, following slide. But what you can do is you can turn, you can stick for a compressor, for a compression po process, the polytropic efficiency, which is uh, denoted by a little p, is gamma minus, minus 1 upon np gamma. And for an expansion process, it's the other way around. It's just it's two ways of saying the same thing. Polytropic efficiency and isentropic efficiency are related. You could use either one of them. Um, it's kind of up to you. But there's, there's reasons for using poly rather than isentropic efficiency. But uh, you probably won't need to bother about it in this course. So here we are. Um, you can see here that this is for a compressor, and uh, okay, you can 
do the maths if you want, added them here. So what we're saying here is that for a compressor, uh, the isentropic efficiency is some function of polytropic efficiency here. Okay, so they are related, they're not two independent uh, kind of properties. And similarly for a turbine, you've got the isentropic efficiency of a turbine is a function of polytropic efficiency in the turbine as well. Okay. So the efficiencies are not the same, but you use either one of them, you've just got to use different equations to um, use them with. Right, so uh, thermal efficiency then, well this is pretty generic. Um, what it sort of is, is like work out divided by heat supplied. So heat, supply, heat supplied minus heat rejected is work out divided by heat supplied. And work ratio here is like network divided by gross work. These are pretty standard things, don't just apply to uh, gas turbines. Uh, I don't like using this term work ratio, I don't think it has any function, but other people like to use it, so we're fine. Um, it goes on over down here, it says that uh, the work ratio depends only on the pressure ratio, not just the pressure ratio, but the uh, maximum and minimum temperatures. So I'm given inlet temperature T1, the maximum temperature T3 must be as high as possible for a high work ratio. So you, you want this number here to be as high as possible. And the higher you have the the higher you have the, the maximum cycle temperature, the higher the efficiency is. Specific fuel consumption then as well, that's 3,600 times the mass of fuel divided by the net power out. Uh, so this is an expression of cycle performance uh, in terms of fuel consumption per net power out. So it's just it's another way of uh, comparing cycles. People like to calculate this number. So, that's about all the equations you'll ever need to uh, solve a gas turbine problem. And I uh, want to go on and talk a bit more now about more generic kind of uh, stuff. So, you can have, uh, there's two different types of fuel. You can have fuel which is gaseous. And uh, in general, it's natural gas. So there's a plethora of blinds, which means a lot flames available worldwide and in general they are pr predominantly used for power generation and it's because of low cost and they give good engine life because they've not got much rubbish in them uh, and you get low CO2 emissions because they contain more H2 okay so you get burning things like methane which is CH4 there's quite a lot of hydrogen in that compared to say like a, a liquid fuel where there'll be a lot of carbon um, molecules. They also get liquid fuel as well. Uh, kerosene, well, we use that in aircraft engines because it's got a very high calorific value so uh, we don't need to carry a line around bucket loads of fuel. Uh, it minimises the weight and it's free of corrosive elements as well. Uh, diesel, well, uh, it's used exclusively in marine applications, usually or standby for power generation, or off, well, offshore, they might have used diesel for, excuse me, standby. It costs less than kerosene, and, but it does contain some sulfur. So you can get damage to uh, turbine blades, um, especially if the temperatures, well, if the temperatures within a certain range, which I can't remember now, you get uh, like hot gas corrosion, and it's caused by. Um, impurities in the fuel. Okay, we've also got like residual oils, which means like that's all the rubbish that you can't really do anything with. But, hey, burn it in the gas turbine. But usually these residual oils are quite high viscosity, so they require heating before you can spray them in, as it were. But they can uh, uh, polymerize and form tar and sludge, and they're a lot of the time they're incompatible with oils that you use for like lubrication so if you get them mixed in with that they can form jelly like substances and of course they're very high in carbon so you can get quite excessive deposits on combustors 
they're corrosive and they've got a lot of ash and stuff in them. So they're not really the best in the world, but if they're free, then we can burn them. Burn anything in a gas oven. Burn loads of sins, but it's bread if you want. Burn anything. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about an open cycle gas turbine unit. Um, so we use air as a working fluid uh, and we supply heat into the air directly by uh, burning fuel in the air. And we replace the heater in the closed combustion cycle. Uh, it's just not there, it's kind of taken away. Uh, oh, sorry, you don't replace the heater, sorry. Uh, the heat, uh, heater is replaced by a combustion chamber and uh, the cooler is just taken away. The plant's less bulky, it's less, less expensive, they're quite compact, small size, low weight, and you can get like you can get quite a high specific power out of these. So here's a picture of one, this is a 6 megawatt uh, gas turbine engine. It used to be called a rusted tornado, it's now a Siemens something or other, don't know what number is, SGT 600 maybe, can't remember. So, what does it look like then? Well, here we are, we've got a cross section through this engine, so what we have is you have air coming in at this, into the compressor. It's compressed through various stages. Comes in, this is a reverse flow combustor, so it goes around the outside of the combustion chamber, in through these holes here. Uh, some fuel is sprayed in, burns in here. High temperature gases go out through the combustor. And uh, I think, yeah, here, this is a single shaft engine. So uh, the two turbines are coupled together. So if uh, in a twin shaft engine, it's quite easy to think about. So a twin shaft engine won't have, won't have this coupling here. So you generally have this turbine will drive this compressor, and this turbine will drive the load. But if you've got a single shaft, uh, a proportion of this uh, turbine will drive the compressor and this uh, turbine and proportion of this uh, turbine will drive the load. Okay, so there's, there's two types, there's uh, single and twin shaft engines. So here we go, this is a single shaft end, well this is the easiest one of the whole lot. You've got a compressor that's driven by a turbine, it's got in some fuel, here they are, this is it on a TS diagram. So this is the isentropic temperature, this is the actual temperature. These are all stagnation um, values. This is the, uh, the turbine inlet temperature, and this is the uh, real turbine outlet temperature. This is the ideal uh, turbine exit. Are you alright? Yeah. No, you're not falling off the chair, sleeping or anything. No. Okay, so why even bother with having single and twin shaft engines, right? Well, single shaft operates at a fixed speed. You, you, the, the load's varied at constant speed, so that means you inject more fuel if you want. But these require a high torque for starting because you've got to turn over the whole engine. But uh, because it's a big, huge mass, uh, you've, you've got... So if you want to accelerate the mass, it's a big mass that you've got to accelerate. You've got a lot of drag, so it uh, reduces the danger of overspeeding when you take the load off too quick. Regulation of speed is easier than a twin shaft, and this is quite easy. Well, the, if you change from 50 to 60 hertz generation, you require to change the gearbox because they run at constant speed. But it can be brought up to full load really quickly because all you've got to do is put in more fuel, so it's not really a problem. Here we've got a twin shaft. Okay, so this time you've got a high pressure turbine driving a compressor and a low pressure turbine driving a generator. So here we are, you can see it on a TS diagram, we've got a two stage uh, expansion here. Okay, so what about properties of a twin shaft engine? Well, you could, uh, you could take an aircraft and an engine, uh, I could take an engine and an aircraft, in fact, get a bit, um, sort of, a bit dementia, keep it in the other thing. And uh, you can use a modified aircraft engine as a as a, a, a power generation device. These operate at variable speed, so the, the output shaft is a function of how much fuel you're putting in. 
got a low stand dock because all you've got to drive is a compressor and a compressor turbine. You don't need to turn over the, the power turbine that's set up. But you've got, you can rapidly shed a load here if you bring on a load too quick or drop the load off too quick, you can get overspeeding of the power turbine or you can get the power turbine can't accelerate fast enough so you'll get a reversal of flow. You get a big bang and that's called a compressor surge and uh, everybody's running away to the loo if they've not been expecting it because they'll get a bit of a fright. Uh, you can change from 50 to 60 hertz uh, Power generation quite easy because you just put in less fuel or whatever. And part load fuel consumption is much better than a single shaft because you don't have to turn over this uh, single shaft. Um, uh, for part uh, part load, you can reduce the speed so uh, you can keep the same output speed uh, by um, just changing the fuel consumption and you're changing the speed of uh, what they would call like the gas generator which is the compressor in the compressor turbine. Okay so what about how do we go about increasing power in an industrial gas turbine and well you can increase the maximum cycle temperature T max but uh, nothing's ever for free. Uh, you'll reduce creep life and every uh, in general every 10k or C that you increase the maximum cycle temperature you'll reduce the creep life of your blades by half. Uh, so what this means is you've got to use higher quality alloys or you could use the air-cooled turbine rotor and stator blades but then if you cool the blades you've got to take the air from the engine so you've got to uh, offset the maximum cycle temperature to take account of this because the air has to come from somewhere so if you put air through the blades take that from the engine, there's less mass flow so you need a higher temperature, so it's, uh, as I said, nothing's ever, ever for free. Okay, you can also increase the turbine pressure ratio, but then you might have to go to twin or triple spool engines, which means you can have multiple um, uh, turbines, maybe driving multiple compressors. Uh, and you might have to have variable state of blades on several stages of the compressor. Uh, larger, so you, what you're saying is you've got to have a bigger compressor. So if you get a larger subsonic compressor or transonic compressor, it means that the Mach number of the flow going through the compressor blades is between, uh, Mach numbers between 0.8 and 1.2. And they are more difficult to balance, so transonic compressors are more difficult to balance, and large subsonic compressors are more difficult to balance because you've got a large rotating mass. And uh, transonic compressors, you can get shock waves, which are not good, which lead to vibration. So, we could have another way of doing all this. You could have water injection into the flame. Right, this uh, reduces the thermal efficiency because it's lower than the maximum cycle temperature. But you get an increased mass flow rate through the turbine. Uh, it also increases specific heat capacity because it's, it's now water and air rather than water and it reduces NOx emissions. So people will quite like to do that. Uh, you could do steam injection, so rather than injecting water into the flame, you inject steam downstream of the combustion chamber. You've got an increase in thermal efficiency, it increases the mass flow rate through the turbine, uh, and you also you get an increase in CP, because again it's steam and air rather than just uh, air or combustion gases I should say. And it also reduces NOx uh, efficiency. You can generally push, you can almost double the power output on a gas turbine, industrial gas turbine, by doing steam injection, if you're into that sort of thing. For example, you get a, was an LM5000, a GE engine, it's 33 megawatts, if you steam inject it, you'll put it up to 55. So it's, it's not small. Uh, we can intercool the compressor, nobody ever does this because it's far too uh, technical and difficult and it's just too difficult to do. Uh, but I'll increase the thermal efficiency and it adds to the cost in bulk. Well, uh, it seems to be good for marine applications because they're out in the sea anyway and it's good for part load efficiency. But I've never seen 
an intercooled compressor on a dastardly. Maybe because I've not been in a ship, but I've never seen one. You can also uh, use reheat, or in the uh, aircraft engine uh, industry, they call it after burning. It increases the thermal efficiency, reduces the mass flow rate through the compressor, compressor turbine because you've got uh, a higher. Um, well, you can get more power out by injecting heat between two, well, fuel between two turbines. But it's not really used that much because uh, you have to have additional combustion chambers. Uh, and there's also associated control problems because you're burning fuel in uh, exhaust rather than burning fuel in air. So it can be quite difficult to control this. In aircraft, um, nobody really seems to bother too much about it because it's, it's kind of done in a different way. Right, so uh, we can also add heat exchangers. And this is kind of starting to look at the combined cycle, encroaching on combined cycle gas turbines. So if you add a heat exchanger uh, on the inlet uh, from between the compressor and the combustion chamber, you'll reduce the size of the compressor, you'll increase the thermal efficiency, uh, and you'll but it will reduce uh, power output because the gases that you're using uh, to uh, to use for, say, your combined uh, cycle, you're not expanding the gas down to atmospheric pressure, you're expanding it down to atmospheric pressure plus a bit in your engine. So you lose a bit of power output, but you get a lot more back in hot water at about 60 degrees C or something. So the, these are the modifications to the basic cycle, intercooling, reheat, and heat exchange. So here's intercooling. Oh, here we are. You can see here, got an intercooler, combustion chamber, and uh, this is your network head. So here's the, the, uh, the, this, the equations you would use to analyze it telling you what the work input is within the cooling arm, thing. And here it's shown on a TS uh, diagram. Reheat, well, um, you've got two combustion chambers here. There's still a pain in the neck. I've never really seen this on an industrial engineer. Uh, and here it's shown on a, um, uh, a TS diagram. Reheat will increase the network out because these lines diverge as they go from uh, left to right. So for the same um, pressure drop, because you've added a bit of heat, you get there's a bigger difference between say zero five and six dash than from zero four to eight dash. So you get more work out. So here's our heat exchanger. Well, here we are. So we'd expand down. Uh, this is a bit above atmospheric. There's atmospheric pressures down here. Uh, you want to heat up the air here before it goes into the combustion chamber, so it means you add less fuel. But nothing's ever for free, ever, ever. Um, okay, so if we're talking about a heat exchanger, you've got a pressure drop across the heat exchanger. Heat transfer is not perfect. Term called effectiveness. And this is it defined here, okay? So, that's really uh, all I've got to... Uh, kind of say about that. Did you find that riveting or did you fall off your chair a couple of times because it was so interesting? No, I didn't fall off my chair. No. <laughs> it was all right. So oh, that's, good. That's, that's kind of my take on gas turbine. Um, again, uh, I'm not going to be around next week. So uh, what I would suggest that you uh, you do is there's, uh, there's, there's two weeks worth of notes on uh, blackboard for gas turbine stuff. So um, for this week, go over these notes, and I think you should be able to do some of the tutorial questions. And then the week I'm off, just have a look at the at the, the notes for the combined cycle stuff. But I'll go over that uh, when I come back because we're, we're doing quite well for time. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we've got uh, there's six weeks left after I come back from China.
and I think we've only got about, after this one, we've only got two topics to do. So there will be quite a bit for revision and stuff. Okay? Yeah, so that's good. So like, what are you wanting the coursework in for? Well, plenty of time for that. Don't even yeah. worry about that. Because, because uh, we've had quite a bit of... Um, uh, I don't want to say a problem, it's just we've had issues with people not understanding, or like IT people not understanding what I'm wanting. And, you know, you're having to run it on your laptop and stuff like that, which I think is a bit unfair. So I'm kind of, because it's only like yourselves and us that's doing it, and it's me that's marking it, I'm kind of okay with it in the, the end of November. That's what I mean, I'll be okay with that. Right. Now, uh, there, there might be... <sighs> when we get it all set up so I could run Star CCM Plus on my laptop in this type of room, then we might have one, a little tutorial session on what I would really like you to do. Um, what I've said in the descriptor up to now is I want you to get through the introduction tutorials. And then really once you've, you've done that, you're at a stage that you're able to, for us to discuss about what you need to go and do next. Okay? Yeah. All right? So if you're okay with that, then we'll just leave it as that. Don't, I mean, if, if, if you find it quite enjoyable, right? You're allowed to do other tutorials as well, you know, but uh, the, the thing is that these are the minimum that you need to, to do. And there's, there's, why I've put these down is, there's, is, is to make it um, efficient on the way that you solve these problems. Okay, I mean, you could solve this problem without doing what I'm going to suggest that you do, but it's not as efficient. But you can still do it, you know. But, um, and the, the whole reason for doing this sort of thing is, that I've said to my uh, students down here, is um, if you ever go for a job interview, right, and you want to talk about, you know, they might say to you, what did you do at college? Tell us about a coursework or something that you did. If you can talk about this one really quite well, because you could say, well, we did erosion modeling with CFD at college. And what you would get is you'll get people turning around and saying to you, we don't need to do that with CFD, we just use the DNB model, right? And then mm -hmm. you can laugh at them because the DNB model is like probably an order of magnitude more conservative than a CFD one. And it doesn't take any account of what the flow does upstream or downstream from the component that you're looking at. So what about, say for example, if, okay, you, you're not going to do this in your coursework, but say you've got like a, a huge pipeline uh, complex with TPCs, bends, diffusers, uh, uh, what's opposite of a diffuser? A nozzle. Okay, <laughs> You can then determine what the erosion is going to be in each of these components but, and you know what the flow rate is like upstream and downstream and what the flow profile is because it's all been calculated with CFD. You can't do that with the DNB model, right? Because you, you just can't because it's not, it's not, you can't do it because it's not in there. So the DNV model has actually been coded into the CFD. So you can work it. It's, it's really, I think it's a really quite good coursework. Mm. Uh, well, I would say that because I wouldn't give you a bad one, you know. But uh, no, I think it'd be a it's a really good um, uh, coursework to do. Plus, you get a little bit of experience of um, of uh, using the CFD program. One of the things yeah, I'm going to use it for my project as well. All right, good man. If you need any advice, I'm your man. Okay. Because right, it's going um, for a hydraulic circuit, so. All right, okay. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, yes. One of the things that you need to look at and understand is you need to look at something called World Y Plus. Now, you can, uh, you can. I think on the, you can either check it out on the help from CD Rapco. You can look it up in textbooks, or you can do a search on that. Um, cfdonline.com and find make sure that you understand what Y plus really is about. Okay? So uh, what it kind of means is in generic terms is somebody's developed a correlation where you can uh, determine wall shear stress as a function of non-dimensional distance from the wall. Okay? But what this means is that if you it generally works between this um, 
this parameter y plus between 1 and 250. But if you have a y plus, which means a very large cell close to the wall, you won't capture much of the boundary layer. So your shear stress prediction will not be that good. So the closer it is to um, round about 1 or whatever, the better you're going to calculate the shear stress. Now that's important for Lagrangian particle flows and erosion modelling. The um, uh, some perfectionists where people uh, do 2D flows over the aircraft wings, they'll have like 100 uh, layers, of com prism layers, what they call them, uh, next to the, to the boundary to capture the shear stress. Uh, there's no real need for that. Um, in the kind of the, the analysis we are doing, between four and six uh, prism layers is fine. And what I would suggest that you did is you started off, and you can do this within the code. I'm only telling you this because you seem to be, you know, you've, you've kind of moved along a bit with it. When you're setting up your prism layer, you need to uh, find out how to set your near wall, your first near wall prism layer to a tenth of a millimeter. So it'll be one e minus four meters. You can you can do it within the there's you can look through the there's uh, drop down boxes and stuff within the CFD code that'll allow you to do that. Okay. Yeah, I think one okay. of the first ones, you know, in the coursework you were recommending, yes. is actually one of the way you actually do that. All right. Okay. Oh, I, I, I didn't know that. So fine. Here you go. Uh, so. Uh, see with these tutorials, even you might want to experiment about, say, just for even running the tutorial and changing Y plus and see what it does, you know, see what effect it has on uh, shear stress and stuff. But yeah. we need to have, uh, we need to get it, the the boundary layer reasonably well um, modelled close to the wall for erosion because that's where it's all happening, close to the wall. Mm. You can get um, you get people that they just don't think. Right, and one of them was my ex-boss, and uh, he, when we were doing this, we had to put so many prism layers in next to the wall that um, the actual particle diameter was bigger than the first cell. So that's kind of just like ridiculous, you know, it's just nonsense, you wouldn't do that. But you try telling people and then they, they, they don't listen. I don't know if you had a look through the presentation that I gave about the coursework. Should be recorded somewhere. I don't know if you were around that day. No, I think I was away that that day. Right, okay. that's good. it tells you useful things in there. Um, mm. It's the, what you're doing for a coursework is an actual real case that I did in a CFD consultancy. So it's mm. it's not a made up it's not a made up thing in my head. It's a real job that I did, and um, it's the presentation that I gave that's recorded was the presentation that I gave at a conference. So it's all, it's all real stuff, mate. There's nothing academic about this. So hopefully you'll find it useful or interesting or both, perhaps. So. Okay, so uh, do you have any more questions or you all right on Mr. Hattie? No, I think that's... I'm all good, yeah. Yeah, you're Mr. Hattie. Good. I'm always happy. Yeah, is that right? Uh, right. So, what I would say to you is, uh, do you do the SNR as well? Yes. Safety and reliability. No, I'll be doing that next okay. year. Oh, next year, right? Okay. Because I was going yeah. to say I'm off. I'm off for that as well. So, um, and let see you for next um, Thursday. Don't bother coming in, mate, because there'll be nobody here. Yeah. So, no worries. You can you can always email me in China if you've got any questions. But just remember the time difference. Okay? So yeah, that's perfect. You're okay with that. You're okay with that. And we'll, I'll see you in uh, a fortnight. Okay? See you in a fortnight then, I'll... Yeah, then. Right, mate. Right, no, it's just... Right, right. Bye, mate. Yeah. Bye.